Good afternoon. My name is Emma and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the NVIDIA's third quarter earnings call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a uh, question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press the star one. Thank you. Simona Jankowski, you may begin your conference. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NVIDIA's conference call for the third quarter of fiscal 2023. With me today from NVIDIA are Jensen Huang, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Colette Kress, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I'd like to remind you that our call is being webcast live on NVIDIA's Investor Relations website. The webcast will be available for replay until the conference call to discuss our financial results for the fourth quarter and fiscal 2023. The content of today's call is NVIDIA's property. It can be reproduced or transcribed without our prior written consent. During this call, we may make forward-looking statements based on current expectations. These are subject to a number of significant risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may differ materially. For a discussion of factors that could affect our future financial results in business, please refer to the disclosure in today's earnings release, our most recent forms 10K and 10Q, and the reports that we may file on Form 8K with the Securities and Exchange Commission. All our statements are made as of today, November 16, 2022, based on information currently available to us. Except as required by law, we assume no obligation to update any such statements. During this call, we will discuss non-GAAP financial measures. You can find a reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP financial measures in our CFO commentary, which is posted on our website. With that, let me turn the call over to Colette. Thanks, Simona. Q3 revenue was $5.93 billion, down 12% sequentially and down 17% year-on-year. We delivered record data center and automotive revenue while our gaming and pro visualization platforms declined as we worked through channel inventory corrections and challenging external conditions. Starting with data center, revenue of 3.83 billion was up 1% sequentially and 31% year on year. This reflects very solid performance in the face of macroeconomic challenges, new export controls, and lingering supply chain disruptions. Year-on-year, growth was driven primarily by leading U.S. cloud providers and a broadening set of consumer Internet companies for workloads such as large language models, recommendation systems, and generative AI. As the number and scale of public cloud computing and Internet service companies deploying NVIDIA AI grows, our traditional hyperscale definition will need to be expanded to convey the different end market use cases. We will align our data center customer commentary going forward accordingly. Other vertical industries such as automotive and energy also contributed to growth with key workloads relating to autonomous driving, high performance computing, simulations, and analytics. During the quarter, the US government announced new restrictions impacting exports of our A100 and H100 based products to China and any product destined for certain systems or entities in China. These restrictions impacted third quarter revenue, largely offset by sales of alternative products into China. That said, demand in China more broadly remains soft, and we expect that to continue in the current quarter. We started shipping our flagship H100 data center GPU based on the new Hopper architecture in Q3. H100-based systems are available starting this month from leading server makers, including Dell, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Lenovo, and Supermicro. Early next year, the first H100-based cloud instances will be available on Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. H100 delivered the highest performance and workload versatility for both AI training and inference in the latest MLPerf industry benchmarks. H100 also delivers incredible value compared to the previous generation for equivalent AI performance 
it offers 3x lower total cost of ownership while using 5x fewer server nodes and 3.5x less energy. Earlier today, we announced a multi-year collaboration with Microsoft to build an advanced cloud-based AI supercomputer to help enterprises train, deploy, and scale AI, including large state-of-the-art models. Microsoft Azure will incorporate our complete AI stack, adding tens and thousands of A100 and H100 GPUs, Quantum 2, 400 gigabit per second InfiniBand networking, and the NVIDIA AI Enterprise Software Suite to its platform. Oracle and NVIDIA are also working together to offer AI training and inference at scale to thousands of enterprises. This includes bringing to, cloud, to Oracle Cloud Infrastructure the full NVIDIA Accelerated Computing Stack and adding tens of thousands of NVIDIA GPUs, including the A100 and H100. Cloud-based high-performance computing company Rescale is adopting NVIDIA AI Enterprise and other software to address the industrial scientific community's rising demand for AI in the cloud. NVIDIA AI will bring new capability to Rescale's high-performance computing as a service offerings, which include simulation and engineering software used across industries. Networking posted strong growth driven by hyperscale customers and easing supply constraints. Our new Quantum 2 40 gigabit per second InfiniBand and Spectrum Ethernet networking platforms are building momentum. We achieved an important milestone this quarter with VMware, whose leading server virtualization platform, vSphere, has been re-architected over the last two years to run on DPUs and now supports our Bluefield DPUs. Our joint enterprise AI platform is available first on Dell PowerEdge servers. The Bluefield DPU design when pipeline is growing and the number of infrastructure software partners is expanding including Arista, Checkpoint, Juniper, Palo Alto Networks, and Red Hat. The latest top 500 list of supercomputers released this week at Supercomputing 22 has the highest ever number of NVIDIA-powered systems, including 72% of the total and 90% of new systems on the list. Moreover, NVIDIA powers 23 of the top 30 of the green 500 list, demonstrating the energy efficiency of accelerated computing. The number one most energy efficient system is the Flatiron Institute's Henry, which is the first top 500 system featuring our H100 GPUs. At GTC, we announced the NVIDIA Omniverse Computing System, or OVX, reference designs featuring the new L40 GPU based on the Ada Lovelace architecture. These systems are designed to build and operate 3D virtual worlds using NVIDIA Omniverse Enterprise. NVIDIA OVX systems will be available from Innsbruck, Lenovo, and Supermicro by early 2023. Lockheed Martin and Jaguar Land Rover will be among the first customers to receive OVX systems. We are further expanding our AI software and services offerings with NVIDIA and BioNemo large language model services, which are both entering early access this month. These enable developers to easily adapt large language models and deploy customized AI applications for content generation, text summarization, chat box, code development, protein structure, and biomolecular property predictions. Moving to gaming. Revenue of $1.57 billion was down 23% sequentially and down 51% from a year ago, reflecting lower sell-in to partners to help align channel inventory levels with current demand expectations. We believe channel inventories are on track to approach normal levels as we exit Q4. Sell-through for our gaming products was relatively solid in the Americas and EMEA, but softer in Asia-Pac as macroeconomic conditions and COVID lockdowns in China continued to weigh on consumer demand. 
Our new Ada Lovelace GPU architecture had an exceptional launch. The first Ada GPU, the GeForce RTX 4090, became available in mid-October and a tremendous demand and positive feedback from the gaming community. We sold out quickly in many locations and are working hard to keep up with demand. The next member of the Ada family, RTX 4080, is available today. The RTX 40 series GPUs features DLSS 3, the neural rendering technology that uses AI to generate entire frames for faster gameplay. Our third generation RTX technology has raised the bar for computer graphics and helped supercharge gaming. For example, the 15-year-old classic game portal, now reimagined with full ray tracing and DLSS 3, has made it on Steam's top 100 most wish-listed games. The total number of RTX games and application now exceeds 350. There is tremendous energy in the gaming community that we believe will continue to fuel strong fundamentals over the long term. The number of simultaneous users on Steam just hit a record of 30 million, surpassing the prior peak of 28 million in January. Activision's Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 set a record for the franchise with more than 800 million in opening weekend sales, topping the combined box office openings of movie blockbusters, Top Gun Maverick, and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And this month's League of Legends World Championship in San Francisco sold out in minutes, with 18,000 esports fans packed the arena where the Golden State Warriors play. We to continue to expand the GeForce Now cloud gaming service. In Q3, we added over 85 games to the library, bringing the total to over 1,400. We also launched GeForce Now on the new gaming devices, including Logitech, CloudG handheld, Cloud Gaming Chromebooks, and Razer 5G Edge. Moving to ProBiz, revenue of 200 million was down 60% sequentially and down 65% from a year ago, reflecting lower sell-in to partners to help align channel inventory levels with the current demand expectations. These dynamics are expected to continue in Q4. Despite near-term challenges, we believe our long-term opportunity remain intact, fueled by AI simulation, computationally intensive design and engineering workloads. At GTC, we announced NVIDIA Omniverse Cloud Services, our first software and infrastructure as a service offering, enabling artists, developers, and enterprise teams to design, publish, and operate metaverse applications from anywhere on any device. Omniverse Cloud Services runs on Omniverse Cloud Computer, a computing system comprised of NVIDIA OVX for graphics and physics simulation, NVIDIA HDX for AI workloads, and the NVIDIA Graphics Delivery Network, a global scale distributed data center network for delivering low latency metaverse graphics on the edge. Leaders in some of the world's largest industries continue to adopt Omniverse. Home improvement retailer Lowe's is using it to help design, build, and operate digital twins for their stores. Charter Communications, an advanced analytics company, Heavy AI, are creating Omniverse-powered digital twins to optimize Charter's wireless network. And Deutsche Bahn, operator of German's National Railway, is using Omniverse to create digital twins of its rail network and train AI models to monitor the network, increasing safety and reliability. Moving to automotive, revenue of 251 million increased 14% sequentially and 86% from a year ago. Growth was driven by an increase in AI automotive solutions as our customers drive ORIN-based production ramps continue to scale. Automotive has great momentum and is on its way to be our next multi-billion dollar platform. Volvo Cars unveiled the all-new flagship Volvo 
EX90 SUV powered by the NVIDIA Drive platform. This is the first model to use Volvo's software-defined architecture with a centralized core computer containing both Drive Orin and Drive Xavier, along with 30 sensors. Other recently announced design wins and new model introductions include Poson, Auto, Neo, Polestar, and XPeng. At GTC, we also announced that NVIDIA Drive Thor Superchip, the successor to Orin in our Automotive SOC roadmap, Drive Thor delivers up to 2,000 teraflops of performance and leverages technologies introduced in our Grace, Hopper, and Ada architectures. It is capable of running both the automated drive and in-vehicle infotainment systems, simultaneously offering a leap of performance while reducing cost and energy consumption. Drive Thor will be available for automakers' 2025 models with Geely-owned automaker Zeker as the first announced customer. Moving to the rest of the P&L, GAAP gross margins was 53.6%, and non-GAAP gross margins was 56.1%. Gross margins reflects 702 million in inventory charges largely related to lower data center demand in China, partially offset by a warranty benefit of approximately 70 million. Year on year, GAAP operating expenses were up 31% and non-GAAP operating expenses were up 30%, primarily due to higher compensation expenses related to headcount growth and salary increases and higher data center infrastructure expenses. Sequentially, both GAAP and non-GAAP operating expense growth was in the single digit percent and we plan to keep it relatively flat at these levels over the coming quarters. We returned $3.75 billion to shareholders in the form of share repurchases and cash dividends. At the end of Q3, we had approximately $8.3 billion remaining under our share repurchase authorization through December 2023. Let me turn to the outlook for the fourth quarter of fiscal 2023. We expect our data center revenue to reflect early production shipments of the H100, offset by continued softness in China. In gaming, we expect to resume sequential growth with our revenue still below and demand as we continue to work through the channel inventory correction. And in automotive, we expect the continued ramp of our Orin design wins. All in, we expect model, modest sequential growth driven by automotive, gaming, and data center. Revenue is expected to be $6 billion, plus or minus 2%. Gap and non-gap gross margins are expected to be 63.2 and 66%, respectively, plus or minus 50 basis points. Gap operating expenses are expected to be approximately $2.56 billion. Non-gap operating expenses are expected to be approximately $1.78 billion. Gap and non-gap other income and expenses are expected to be an income of approximately $40 million, excluding gains and losses on non-affiliated investments. Gap and non-gap tax rates are expected to be 9%, plus or minus 1%, excluding any discrete items. Capital expenditures are expected to be approximately $500 million to $550 million. Further, financial details are included in the CFO commentary and other information available on our IR website. In closing, let me highlight upcoming events for the financial community. We'll be attending the Credit Suisse Conference in Phoenix on November 30th. The Arete Virtual Tech Conference on December 5th and the JP Morgan Forum on January 5th in Las Vegas. Our earnings call to discuss the results of our fourth quarter and fiscal 2023 are scheduled for Wednesday, February 22nd. We will now open the call for questions. Operator, could you please pull for questions? Thank you. I would like to remind everyone in order to ask a question, press star then the number one on the telephone keypad. As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question. We will pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. 
Your first question comes from the line of Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Colette, I just wanted to uh, clarify first. Um, I think last quarter you gave us a sell-through rate for your gaming business at about uh, $2.5 billion a quarter. I think you said China is, is somewhat weaker, so I was hoping you could update us on what that sell-through uh, rate is right now for gaming. And then, Jensen, the question for you, um, you know, a lot of concerns about large hyperscalers uh, cutting their spending and pointing to a slowdown. So if, let's say, U.S. cloud capex is flat, you know, or slightly down next year, do you think your business can still grow uh, in, in the data center and, and why? Yes, thanks for the question. Uh, let me first start with the sell-through on our gaming business. We had indicated if you put two quarters together, uh, we would see approximately $5 billion uh, in normalized uh, sell-through uh, for our business. Now, during the quarter, sell-through in Q3 uh, was relatively solid. Uh, we've indicated that uh, although China lockdowns uh, continue to channel uh, excuse me, uh, challenge our overall uh, China business, uh, it was still relatively solid. Notebook sell-through uh, was also quite solid, and desktop a bit softer, uh, particularly in that China and Asia uh, areas. Uh, we expect, though, stronger end demand, though, as we enter into Q4, uh, driven by the upcoming holidays, as well as the continuation of the ADA adoption. In fact, our data center business is indexed to two fundamental dynamics. The first has to do with general purpose computing no longer scaling. And so acceleration is necessary to achieve uh, the necessary level of cost efficiency scale and energy efficiency scale. Uh, so that we can continue to increase workloads while uh, saving money and, and saving power. Uh, accelerated computing is recognized generally as the path forward um, as general purpose computing slows. The second dynamic is AI. And we're, sur we're seeing surging demand in some very important sectors of AI, in, in, uh, important breakthroughs in AI. One is called Deep Recommender Systems, which uh, is uh, quite essential now uh, to get the best content or item or product to recommend to somebody who's using a, a device that is you know, like, a, like a cell phone or interacting with a computer just using voice. Um, you, you need to really understand the nature, the context of the person making the request and uh, make the appropriate recommendation to them. The second has to do with large language models. Uh, this, is, this started uh, several years ago with the invention of the transformer, which led to BERT, which led to uh, GPT-3, which led to a whole bunch of other models now associated with that. We now have the ability to uh, learn rec representations of languages of all kinds. It could be human language. It could be the language of biology, it could be the language of chemistry. And recently, um, I just saw a breakthrough called Genes LM, uh, which is one of the, the first example of learning the language of uh, human genomes. The third has to do with generative AI. You know that the first 10 years, we've dedicated ourselves to perception AI. Uh, the goal of perception, of course, is to understand context, um, but the ultimate goal of AI is to make a contribution, to create something, to generate product. And this is now the beginning of the era of generative AI. Now, you probably see it all over, all over the place, whether they're generating images or generating um, videos or generating text um, uh, of all kinds. And the ability to uh, augment uh, our performance, to enhance our performance, uh, to make productivity uh, enhanced uh, to reduce cost uh, and improve whatever we do with whatever we have to work with, uh, productivity is, is really more important than ever. And so, so you can see that our company is indexed to two things, uh, both of which are more important than ever, which is uh, uh, power efficiency, uh, cost efficiency, 
and then of course productivity. And these things are these things are um, uh, more important than ever. And my my expectation is that, that we're seeing all this strong demand and uh, surging demand for for AI for these reasons. Your next question comes from the line of CJ Moves with Evercore. Your line is now open. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. Um, you, you started to uh, bundle in NVIDIA AI Enterprise now with the H100. Uh, I'm curious if you can talk about um, how we should think about, you know, timing around software modernization uh, and how we should kind of see this flow through the model, particularly with a focus on, on, on the AI Enterprise and Omniverse side of things. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, CJ. Uh, we're making excellent progress in NVIDIA AI Enterprise. In fact, you you uh, saw uh, probably that we made several announcements uh, this uh, this quarter associated with clouds. You know that NVIDIA has a rich ecosystem, and uh, over the years, our rich ecosystem and, and our software stack has been integrated into uh, developers and startups of, uh, of all kinds. Um, but more so, more than ever, we're at the tipping point of clouds, and that's fantastic because uh, if we could get NVIDIA's architecture and our full stack into every single cloud, we could reach more customers more quickly. And uh, this quarter, uh, we announced several initiatives. One uh, has several partnerships and collaborations. Uh, one uh, that we announced today, which has to do with Microsoft and our partnership there. It has everything to do with scaling up AI because we have uh, so many startups clamoring for large installations of our GPU so that they could do large language model training and building their startups uh, and scale out of AI to enterprise and uh, all of the world's internet service providers. Um, every company we're talking to uh, would like to have the agility and the scale uh, flexibility of clouds. And so over the last uh, year or so, we've been uh, working on moving all of our software stacks uh, to the cloud, all of our platform and software stacks to the cloud. And so today we announced that uh, Microsoft and ourselves are, um, are going to standardize on the NVIDIA stack uh, for, uh, for a very large part of the, the, uh, the work that we're doing together so that we can take a full stack out to the world's enterprise. Uh, that's all software included. Uh, we, we um, uh, a month ago, announced the same uh, similar, uh, similar type of partnership with Oracle. Uh, you uh, also saw that Rescale, uh, a leader in high-performance computing cloud, uh, has integrated NVIDIA AI into their stack. Uh, Monai uh, has been integrated into uh, GCP. Uh, and uh, we announced recently uh, Nemo large language model and BioNemo large language model to put NVIDIA software in the cloud. And we also announced Omniverse is in, now available in the cloud. The goal of, of all of this all of this is to move the NVIDIA platform full stack software into the cloud so that we can engage customers uh, much, much more quickly and customers could engage our software uh, if they would like to use it uh, in the cloud. It's per GPU uh, instance hour. Uh, if they would like to utilize our software on-prem, uh, they could uh, uh, do, do it through a software license. Um, and so uh, license and subscription. And so in both cases, we now have uh, we now have software um, uh, available practically everywhere you would like to engage it. Uh, the partners that we work with are super excited about it because NVIDIA's rich ecosystem uh, is global, and this could uh, bring uh, both uh, new consumption into the cloud uh, for both them and ourselves, uh, but also connect uh, all of these uh, new opportunities to the other APIs and other services that they offer. And so, so uh, our, our software stack is making really great progress. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Queso with Credit Suisse. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Um, I wonder if you could give some more color about uh, the inventory charges uh, you took in the quarter and then internal inventory in general. Um, 
in, in the documentation, you, you talked about that being a portion of inventory on hand plus some purchase obligations, and you also spoke uh, uh, in your prepared remarks that, that some of this was, was due to China data center. So if you can clarify what was in those charges, and then in general for your internal inventory, does that still need to be worked down um, and, and what are the implications as, as if, if that needs to be worked down over the next couple of quarters? Thanks for the question, uh, Chris. Uh, so as we highlighted uh, in our uh, prepared remarks, uh, we booked an entry of $702 million uh, for in inventory reserves within the quarter. Uh, most of that, primarily all of it, is related uh, to our data center business. Uh, just due to the change in expected demand looking forward for China. So when we look at the data center products, uh, a good portion of this was also the A100, uh, which we wrote down. Now looking at our inventory that we have on hand and uh, the inventory that uh, has increased, a lot of that is just due to our upcoming architectures coming to market. Our ADA architecture, our Hopper architecture, uh, and even more in terms of our networking business. Uh, we have uh, been building uh, for those architectures to come to market, and that's what you see. We are always looking at our inventory levels at the end of each quarter uh, for our expected demand going forward, uh, but I think we've uh, done a solid job, at least in this quarter, uh, just based on that expectation going forward. Your next question comes from the line of Timothy R. Curie with UBS. Your line is now open. Thanks a lot. Um, Colette, can you, I have a uh, you know, two-part two -part question. First, is there any effect of stockpiling in the, in the um, you know, data center guidance? Um, I ask because you now have the A800 that is sort of a modified version of the A100 with the lower data transfer rate. So one could imagine that customers might be stocking that while they can still get it. And I guess the you know, second part of that is related to the inventory charge, um, uh, it, can you just go into that a little bit more? Because last quarter it made sense that you took a charge because you know, revenue was less than you thought, but revenue came in pretty much in line and it sounded like China was a net neutral. So is the charge related to just you know, working A100 inventory down faster? Is that, is that what the charge is related to? Thanks. Sure, so let me, let me talk about the first uh, statement that uh, you indicated. Most of our data center business um, uh, that we see is we're working with customers specifically on their needs uh, to build out accelerated computing and AI. Uh, it's just uh, not a business in terms of where uh, units are being held uh, for that. They're usually for very, very specific products um, and uh, projects that we see. So I'm gonna answer no. Uh, nothing that we can see. Your second question uh, regarding the inventory provisions. At the end of last quarter, uh, we were uh, beginning to see softness uh, in China. We have always been looking at our needs long term. It's not a statement about the current quarter in inventory, as you can see. It usually takes two or three quarters for us to build product uh, for the future demand. So that's always a case of the inventory uh, that we are ordering. So now looking at uh, what we've seen in terms of continued lockdowns, continued economy challenges in China, it was time for us to take a hard look of what do we think we'll need for data center going forward. And that led to our write downs. Your next question comes from the line of Stacy Rasgon with Bernstein. Your line is now open. Hi guys, thanks for taking my question. Um, Colette, I had a question on the commentary you gave on the sequentials. Um, it kind of sounded like data center maybe had some China softness issues. You said gaming resuming sequential growth, but then you said sequential growth for the company driven by auto gaming and data center. How can all three of those grow sequentially if the overall guide is kind of flattish? Are they all just like growing just a little bit or is one of them actually down? Like how do we think about the segments into Q4 given that commentary? Yes, thanks, Stacey. Um, so your question is regarding uh, the sequentials from uh, Q3 to our guidance that we provided for Q4. Uh, as we are seeing, the numbers in terms of our guidance, you're correct, is only growing about 100 million, and we've indicated that three of those platforms will likely grow just a little bit. But our pro-visualization business, um, uh, we think is going to be flattish 
um, and uh, likely not growing as we're still working on uh, correcting the channel inventory levels uh, to get to the right uh, amount. It's very difficult to say which will have um, uh, uh, that increase, but again, we are planning for all three of those different market platforms to grow just a little bit. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Lipesis with Jeffries. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Jensen, I think for you, you've articulated a vision for the data center where a solution with uh, an integrated solution set of a CPU, GPU, and DPU is deployed for all workloads or most, most workloads, I think. Um, could you just give us a sense of or talk about where where is this vision in the penetration cycle and, and maybe talk about Grace Grace's importance for uh, realizing that vision? Um, will what what will uh, what will Grace uh, deliver versus an off the shelf x86? Where, do you have a sense of where Grace will get embraced first or the fastest um, within that vision? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Grace's data moving capability uh, is off the charts. Grace also is memory coherent to our GPU, which allows our GPU to expand its effective GPU memory, fast GPU memory, by a factor of 10. Uh, that's not possible with without uh, special capabilities that are designed between Hopper and Grace and the architecture of Grace. And so it was designed, Grace is designed uh, for very large data processing at very high speeds. Those applications are related to, uh, for example, data processing uh, is related for recommender systems, uh, which operates on petabytes of live data at a time. It's all hot, it all needs to be fast so that you can make a recommendation within milliseconds uh, to hundreds of millions of people using your service. Uh, it is also uh, quite effective at uh, uh, AI training, machine learning. And so those kind of applications are, are, um, are really terrific. We, uh, Grace, I think, um, uh, I've said before that we will have uh, production samples in Q1, and we're we're still on track to do that. Your next question comes from the line of Harlan Sir with J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, your data center networking business, I believe, is driving about $800 million per quarter in sales, very, very strong growth over the past few years, near term, as you guys pointed out. And the team is driving strong NIC and Bluefield attached to your own compute solutions like DGX and more partner announcements like VMware. But we also know that networking has pretty large exposure to general purpose cloud and hyperscale compute spending trends. So what, what's the visibility and growth outlook for, for the networking business over the next few quarters? Yeah, if I could take that. The, um, uh, first, th thanks for the question. Our networking, as you know, is heavily indexed to high-performance computing. We're not, we, don't rep we don't serve the vast majority of commodity uh, networking. Uh, all of our networking solutions are very high-end. And they're designed for uh, uh, data centers that move a lot of data. Now, if you have if you have a hyperscale data center these days, and you are deploying a large number of AI applications, it, it is very likely that the network bandwidth that you you provision uh, has a substantial implication on the overall throughput of your data center. So the the small incremental investment they make in high performance networking translates to billions of dollars of savings, frankly, in provisioning the, the service or billions of dollars more throughput, which increases their, their, um, uh, their economics. And so these days, with disaggregated and AI uh, application, AI provisioning in data centers, 
high performance networking is really quite fantastic and, and it pays for itself right away. But that's, that's where we are focused uh, in high performance networking and provisioning AI services and, um, uh, in well, the, the AI applications that that, that um, we focus on. Now, you might you might have noticed that that uh, Nvidia and Microsoft are building one of the largest AI infrastructures in the world, and it is completely powered by uh, M Nvidia's InfiniBand uh, 400 gigabits per second network. And the reason for that is because that network pays for itself instantaneously. Uh, the the investment that you're going to put into the infrastructure is so significant. Uh, that uh, if you were to be dragged by uh, slow networks, uh, you know, the, the, obviously the efficiency of the overall inf infrastructure is is not as high. And so, in the places where we focus, uh, networking is really quite quite important. Uh, it goes all the way back to when we first announced uh, the acquisition of Mellanox. Uh, I think at the time uh, they were doing about a few hundred million dollars a quarter, about four hundred million dollars a quarter, and um, uh, now now we're we're uh, you know we're doing what what they used to do uh, in the old days, uh, you know, in a year, uh, practically coming up in a quarter, and so so that kind of tells you about the growth of high performance networking. Uh, it, it is it is an index to overall enterprise and uh, data center spend but it is highly indexed to uh, AI adoption. Your next question comes from the line of Aaron Rakers with Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking the question. I, I want to expand on, on the networking question a little bit further. You know, when we look at the Microsoft announcement today, um, we, we think about what Meta is doing on the IA fo AI footprint that they're deploying. You know, Jensen, can you help us understand like where your InfiniBand networking sits uh, relative to like traditional data center switching, uh, and, and maybe kind of build on that how you're positioning Spectrum Four in the market? Does that compete against a broader set of opportunities in the Ethernet world for for AI fabric networking? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. The the, the math is like this: if you're going to spend twenty billion dollars on an infrastructure, and the efficiency of that overall data center is improved by 10%. The numbers are huge, and when when we when uh, uh, when we do these these uh, large language models and recommender systems, the processing is done across the entire data center, and so we distribute the workload across multiple GPUs, multiple nodes, and it runs for a very long time, and so. So the the importance of the network can't be can't be overemphasized, and and so the the difference the difference of ten percent um, uh, in in overall uh, improvement in efficiency, which is which is very easy to achieve. Uh, the difference between Nvidia's InfiniBand, the entire software stack, uh, with what we call Magnum I/O, which allows us to do computing in the in the network itself. A lot of software is running in the network itself, not just moving data around. We call it in-network computing because a, a ton of software is done at the edge of the at the uh, within the network itself. Uh, we achieve significant differences in overall efficiency. And so, if, if you're if you're spending billions of dollars on the infrastructure. Uh, or even hundreds of millions of dollars of on the infrastructure, the difference is really quite profound. Your next question comes from the line of Ambrish Stravastava with BMO. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you very much. I actually had a couple of clarifications. Colette, on the data center side, is it a fair assumption that compute was uh, down Q over Q in the reported quarter because the quarter before, uh, Mellanox or, or the networking business was up as it was called out, and again you said it grew quarter over quarter. So is that a fair assumption? And then I had a clarification on the uh, USG ban. It, uh, initially, it was supposed to be 400 million, um, really going to what the government was trying to firewall. Is the A800? I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I understand it. Isn't that against the spirit of what the government is trying to do, i.e., firewall high-performance compute? 
or is A800 going to a different set of customers? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so looking at our compute uh, for the quarter, it's about flattish. Uh, yes, we're seeing um, also growth, growth in terms of our networking, but you should look at our Q3 uh, compute is about flattish with last quarter. Amber, A800, the hardware, the hardware of A800 ensures that it always meets U.S. government's clear test for export control. And it cannot be customer reprogrammed or application reprogrammed to exceed it. It is hardware limited. It is in the hardware that determines 8800's capabilities. And so it meets the clear test uh, in, in, in letter and in spirit. Uh, we, we raised the concern about the $400 million of A100s because we were uncertain about whether we could execute um, the, the introduction of A800 to our customers and through our supply chain in time. Uh, the company, the company did remarkable feats uh, to uh, swarm this this uh, uh, this situation and make sure that that our business was not affected and our customers were not affected. Um, but A800 hardware surely ensures that it always meets U.S. government's clear test for export control. Your next question comes from the line of William Stein with Truist Securities. Your line is now open. Um, thank you. Um, I'm hoping you can discuss the pace of uh, H100 growth as we progress over the next year. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions as to whether the ramp in this product should look like a sort of traditional product cycle where there's quite a bit of pent up demand for this significant improved uh, performance product and that there's supply available as well. Um, so does this rollout sort of look relatively typical from that perspective or should we expect a more um, perhaps delayed start of the growth trajectory where we see maybe substantially more uh, growth in let's say second half of 23? H100 ramp is different than the A100 ramp in several ways. Uh, the, first, the first is that the, the TCO, the cost benefits, the operational cost benefits, because of the energy savings, because uh, every data center is now power limited, and because of this incredible transform, transformer engine uh, that's designed for the latest uh, AI models, the performance over Ampere is so significant that I, and because of the the, uh, the pent up demand um, for Hopper, because of these new models that are that I spoke about earlier, deep recommender systems and large language models and generative AI models, uh, customers are clamoring to ramp Hopper as quickly as possible, and we are trying to do the same. We are all hands on deck. Uh, to help the cloud service providers stand up the supercomputers. Remember, uh, NVIDIA is the only company in the world that produces and ships semi-custom supercomputers in high volume. It's a miracle to ship one supercomputer every three years. Uh, it, it's it's uh, unheard of to ship uh, supercomputers to every cloud service provider uh, in a quarter. And so we're we're working hand in glove with every one of them, um, and every one of them are are racing to stand up hoppers. We expect them uh, to have hopper cloud services stood up in Q1. And so we we are expecting to ship uh, some volume. Uh, we're expecting to ship production in Q4, and then we're expecting to ship uh, large volumes in Q1. 
that's a faster transition than Ampere. And so um, uh, it, it, it's because of, of the dynamics that I've dis dis described. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Ramsey with Cowan. Your line is now open. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I guess, I, Colette, I heard in your script that, that you had talked about uh, maybe a new way of, of commenting on or reporting uh, hyperscaler revenue in your data center business. And I, I wonder um, if you could maybe give us a little bit more detail about what you're thinking there and, and what sort of drove the decision. And I guess the derivative of that, Jensen, um, how that decision to talk about the, the data center business to hyperscalers differently, I mean, what does that mean for the business? That it's just a reflection of where demand is and you're going to break things out differently? Or is something changing about the mix of, I guess, internal properties versus um, vertical industry demand within the hyperscale um, customer base? Thank you. Yes, Matt. Thanks for the question. Let me clarify a little bit in terms of uh, what we believe we should be looking at when we go forward and discussing our data center business. Our data center business is becoming larger and larger, and our customers are complex. Now, when we talk about hyperscale, uh, we tend to talk about uh, seven, eight different companies. But the reality is there's a lot of very large companies that we could add to that discussion uh, based on what they're um, purchasing. Additionally, uh, looking at the cloud, looking at our cloud purchases uh, and what our customers are building for the cloud is an important area to focus on because this is really where our enterprise is, uh, where our researchers, where our higher education is also purchasing. So we're trying to look for a better way to describe the color of what we're seeing in the cloud and also give you a better understanding of some of these large installments that we're seeing in the hyperscales. Yeah, let me let me double click on what what Colette just said, which is which is absolutely right. There are two major dynamics that's happening. First, uh, the adoption of NVIDIA AI in internet service companies around the world, the number and the scale by which they're doing it has grown a lot. Internet service companies that and these are internet service companies that that offer services, but they're not public cloud computing companies. Um, the second, the second factor has to do with cloud computing. We are now at the tipping point of cloud computing. Almost every enterprise in the world uh, has both a cloud first and a multi-cloud strategy. It is exactly the reason why uh, all of the announcements that that uh, we made this this year, uh, this quarter, this last quarter since GTC, about all the new platforms that are now available in the cloud. Uh, a CSP, a hyperscaler. Uh, is both are, are two things to us. Therefore, a hyperscaler uh, can be a sell to customer. Uh, they are also a sell with partner. On the public cloud side of their business, because of the richness of Nvidia's ecosystem, because we have so many internet service customers and enterprise customers using Nvidia's full stack, uh, the public cloud side of their business uh, really enjoys and values the partnership with us and the sell with um, uh, relationship they have with us. And it's pretty clear now that, that for all of the hyperscalers, the public cloud side of their business will likely, will very likely be the vast majority of their overall consumption. And so because, because the world CSPs, um, the, the world's uh, public clouds is only at the early innings of their uh, enterprise to lifting enterprise to the cloud world, uh, it's very, very clear that the public cloud side of the business is going to be very large. And so increasingly, our relationship with CSPs, our, our relationship with hyperscalers uh, will, will include, of course, uh, continue to sell to them for internal consumption, but very importantly, sell with for the public cloud side. Your next question comes from the line of Joseph Moore with Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could talk to, uh, looking backward at the crypto impact, um, obviously that, that's gone from your numbers now, but do you see uh, any potential for liquidation of GPUs that are in the mining network? 
uh, any impact going forward? And, and do you foresee blockchain being an important part of your business at some point down the road? We don't expect to see blockchain being an important part of our business down the road. Uh, there is a there is always a resell market. If you look at um, uh, you know any of the the major resell sites, uh, eBay for example, uh, there are there are secondhand graphics cards for sale uh, all the time, and and the reason for that is because uh, a 3090 that somebody bought today. Uh, um, is upgraded to a 4090, uh, or 3090 they bought a couple of years ago is upgraded to a 4090 today. That 3090 could be sold to somebody and um, uh, enjoyed uh, if, if sold at the right price. And so the the volume of the availability of secondhand and and used graphics cards has always been there, and the inventory is is never zero. And uh, when the inventory is larger than than usual. Uh, like all supply and demand, it would likely drift lower price and um, affect the lower ends of our of our market. Um, but my sense is that my sense is that uh, where we're going right now with ADA is targeting very clearly uh, in the upper range, the top half of our market, and and uh, early early signs are, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're you're also seeing it that the ADA launch was a home run. The 4090, um, uh, you know, we shipped we shipped a large volume of 4090s uh, because, as you know, we were prepared for it, uh, and yet uh, within within minutes they were sold out around the world. And so the the uh, the reception of 4090 and the reception of 4080 today uh, has been off the charts, and that that says something about the the the, the strength and the health and the vibrancy of the gaming market. Um, so, so we're we're uh, super enthusiastic about about the ADA launch. We have uh, many more ADA products to come. Your last question today comes from the line of Toshia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Great. Uh, thank you so much for squeezing me in. Uh, I had two quick ones for for Colette. Um, on supply, um, I think there were some mixed messaging in, in your remarks. I think you talked about supply being a headwind at one point, and then um, when you were speaking to the networking business, I think you talked about supply easing. So um, I was hoping you can kind of speak to supply if, if you're caught up to demand at this point. And then secondly, just on st stock-based compensation, uh, pretty, pretty mundane topic, I, I realize, but it is, um, I think in the quarter, it was about $700 million. It's, it's becoming a bigger piece of your OPEX. So, so curious how we should be modeling that going forward. Thank you. Sure. When we look at our uh, supply constraints uh, that we have had in the past, each and every quarter this is getting better. Uh, networking uh, was one of um, our issues probably a year ago, and it has taken us probably to this quarter um, and next quarter to really see um, our supply improved so that we can support uh, the pipeline that we have uh, for our customers there. Now, that's our supply. We've also made a, a discussion regarding our customers' supply constraints issues. Uh, when setting up a data center, even getting uh, data center capacity has been very difficult. And uh, therefore, that challenges them in their purchasing decisions as they're still looking for certain parts of that supply chain uh, to come through. So that hopefully uh, clarifies what we were talking about regarding two areas of supply. In our stock-based compensation, uh, what we'll see, it's very difficult uh, to predict what our uh, stock-based compensation would be when it uh, arrives. Uh, we have provided uh, to our incoming uh, employees, but also once a year to our employees, and it's a single date in terms of when that is priced. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to determine, uh, but stock-based compensation is an important part of our employees' compensation and will continue to be. So uh, we look at it from an overall uh, compensation perspective. So up until now and when we do the focal, we'll see about the same size. Uh, with a few additions for the uh, uh, reduced level of employee hiring that we have right now. Thank you. I will now turn the call back over to Jensen Huang for closing remarks. Thanks, everyone. We are quickly adapting to the macro environment.
correcting inventory levels, offering alternative products to data center customers in China, and keeping our OPEX flat for the next few quarters. Our new platforms are off to a great start and form the foundation for our resumed growth. NVIDIA RTX is reinventing 3D graphics with ray tracing and AI. The launch of Ada Lovelace is phenomenal. Gamers waited in long lines around the world. 40, 90 stocks sold out quickly. Hopper, with its revolutionary transformer engine, is just in time to meet the surging demand for recommender systems, large language models, and generative AI. NVIDIA networking is synonymous with the highest data center throughput and enjoying record results. Orin is the world's first computing platform designed for AI-powered autonomous vehicles and robotics and putting automotive on the road to be our next multi-billion dollar platform. These computing platforms run NVIDIA AI and NVIDIA Omniverse software libraries and engines that help the companies build and deploy AI through products and services. And this pioneer work in accelerated computing is more vital than ever. Limited by physics, general purpose computing has slowed to a crawl just as AI demands more computing. Scaling through general purpose computing alone is no longer viable, both from a cost or power standpoint. Accelerated computing is the path forward. We look forward to updating you on our progress next quarter.